Welcome to the message for Sunday, March 3rd, 2024, the third Sunday of Lent. I'm Pastor Teresa Heiser from the Penns Valley Charge of the United Methodist Church, beginning with these centering words. The Ten Commandments reveal God's will for our lives. As Jesus threw out money changers, he remembered God's decrees against turning God's house into a marketplace. Our first passage of scripture today comes to us from Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 to 17, and it is the Ten Commandments. I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard Bible, copyright 1995. This is a word-for-word -word translation of the original language. The liberating God does not leave God's people without guidance as they wander in the wilderness. God gives them the Ten Commandments. So hear these words. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, or any likeness of what is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Before we move on to the next passage from John, I want to do a little bit of a primer with regard to the temple in Jerusalem. God wanted his people to have a place to worship him. It would be holy built using the finest materials available, and it would be portable, movable. So I want to hear, or I want you to hear rather, these words from Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9. Let them construct a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell among them. According to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so you shall construct it. King Solomon built the first permanent temple in Jerusalem in the 10th century, even though his father, King David, desperately wanted to build the temple long before. But you see, it was not God's will for King David to build it, according to God's response to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. In the Old Testament book, Two Chronicles, it offers an overview of the building of the temple, specifically chapters two through five. And I encourage you to read those on your own. 
But God gave extremely detailed instructions about the goods, about the design, about the craftsmanship. The furnishings and utensils were made to the precise specifications. And when all was complete, God filled the place with his glory. And with that, I want to go into our last passage of scripture. This is from John chapter 2. You know, God provided, as I said, these very detailed instructions, not only for the construction of the building, but for its use, which was intended for people to gather and get to know God better. God made flesh and blood. Jesus stood in that space watching his temple being misused. Jesus watched the faithful being burdened by this misuse. And worst of all, Jesus watched religious rulers who were willing to compromise God's instruction for personal gain. God's desire to protect the sanctity of the building and the hearts of those that entered would soon make a way for believers to become temples themselves. Hear now the words of John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. This portion is titled in the New American Standard Bible, First Passover, Cleansing the Temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, Jesus said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our message title today is Destroying Evil Systems. It's the third message in our The Power of Sacrifice Lent series. And in this, we're focusing on the idea that Jesus assaults the systems of privilege and power that perpetuate marginalization and oppression. Before we go into the message, let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and go to God in prayer. Teacher Jesus, as we listen to the message today, may the words heard be yours and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Clearing the temple was an act of tremendous love. It was very dramatic, but it was an act of love and reverence for the things of God. It was protecting those who desired true worship but were being prevented from access to it while being exploited by merchants selling animals for sacrifice that these traveling worshipers couldn't possibly have brought with them. And money changers converting different currencies into the accepted form of currency to pay temple taxes were also ripping off the worshipers in that process. It was not good. Jesus boldly showed a lack of respect for those very powers that perpetuated this evil. The powers that were controlling the day-to-day of the temple were both political and religious 
and Jesus showed a lack of respect for both. We don't see any other mention of anyone highlighting the ways that Jewish uh, religious systems in Jerusalem had become a force of wickedness instead of liberation and love. Jesus exposes very publicly the unjust ways of those religious authorities, really calling them to a posture of sacrifice, something that he knew very few would accept, very few were going to jump at. And the way Jesus went about this demonstration in the temple courts guaranteed that he would call uh, a great deal of attention to himself. He was going to he was going to really capture a lot of attention. In fact, that was going to be the talk of the day more so than anything else. It would catch the attention of the patrons who were there, but more importantly, the religious leaders and the government officials who would have immediately tried to end his display before he would inspire a riot. And with their eyes fixed on him, Jesus declared, Destroy this temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. Men standing in the shadow of that grand structure just chuckled at the thought, who does this guy think he is? It took 46 years to build this amazing, huge temple, and he's going to rebuild it in three days. They were also likely plotting Jesus' death in their imaginations. So it's not that they didn't have vivid imaginations. It's just that their use of their imaginations were certainly um, a one-way street, let's put it that way. Lost on them was the idea that Jesus shares so often, that the Spirit of God doesn't dwell in temples does not dwell in systems or organizations, but in flesh and blood human beings. These vessels through which the Spirit of God dwells could and will be destroyed and rebuilt in Jesus' body. Now, Jesus knows the physical temple would not be around much longer. That is very true, and it was not around much longer. He wanted people to realize that they didn't need the temple, that physical temple, in order to be connected to God. The first time we hear that idea is the conversation he has with the Samaritan woman at the well, where the Samaritan woman is asking him, you know, where is it that we're supposed to worship God? We used to worship here on this mountain. Now you say it has to be in the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus tells her that God desires for us to worship in truth and in spirit, in spirit and in truth. And that's coming very, very soon. Jesus is trying to prepare them for that eventuality. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 16 and 17, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. Through systems that have corrupted the original intent, the temple and everything it represented became a hindrance to people connecting with the divine. In fact, it became a force of oppression and injustice. How sad that had to be, not only for the people who came there to worship and had all of this extra nonsense that they had to navigate, how it was just kind of how it was, and it was accepted as this is just how it is, how sad it had to be. No one was sadder about it, though, than the designer of the temple, the designer of worship itself who sent Jesus the word of God in flesh and bone to reform the church according to the word of God that we see and hear 
in the word of God. W. Hewlett Glower wrote this. You cannot understand Jesus until you have the whole story. An incomplete and inadequate understanding of Jesus might just leave us in a temple of our own construction, dedicated to the purposes of God, but actually standing in opposition to them. End quote. It's a lot to think about today, but I, I do want to leave you with uh, with that thought and also close this kind of short message with a word of prayer. Let's bow. Lord Jesus, on this day, we gather to talk to you, to listen to you, and to be guided by you. And because we're in the season of Lent, we come to be rebuked and corrected by you. Speak to us, Lord, even when we don't want to hear what you have to say. Work among us so that this time is more than a time of warm fellowship, but also a time of deep encounter with your spirit and with your truth. Because we do not, in our sin and falsehood, know how to come to you. You must come to us. Make our places of worship that we have built for you a place of meeting between us and you. Judge all the ways that we've allowed other allegiances and affections to crowd out our devotion to you. By your grace, enable us so to experience your presence in those buildings and places so that it becomes more than a place of wood or stone and steel, but rather a place of encounter, revelation, and relationship between you and us. And all God's people said, amen. The season of Lent is a time for us to really take time and reflect on the ways that we are perhaps putting up things that are preventing our true worship of God in spirit and in truth. I mean, we may not set up actual literal marketplaces uh, or, or ways that, that we get um, taken advantage of on our way to the church, but we can set up things that prevent our full and complete worship of God that full surrender to really being able to sit down with the word, read it, hear it proclaimed, and um, challenge ourselves by it. I hope that this word has blessed you today. I hope that you will spend some time this week in your Bibles and really consider why is it that we need this time to connect with God and for God to connect with us. It's really intended for us to become more like Jesus and not for us to make Jesus more like us. With that, I'd like to close with this thought. Go forth with the Lord at your side, seeking goodness and compassion, and bring the words of hope and peace to all whom you meet. Go in peace and know that God goes with you. Amen. You'll find a lot of other information and a schedule of upcoming events, including for Holy Week and Easter Sunday on pennsvalleyparish.info. Till next time we meet, I hope that you have a wonderful and very blessed week.